Welcome to the bonus episode of the series on the SOC Automation Project. This episode will be dedicated on where you can look to hopefully find some answers if you come across some errors during your lab. This is assuming that you have followed the instructions for this project. We'll start off with the cloud. There is not much here, but the main thing is the firewall. Now to get to your firewall, you can click on networking, click on the firewalls tab, and then there will be the firewall that we created. If you can't connect to any of your applications, such as Waza or the Hive, or even if Shuffle cannot connect, you want to make sure to take a look into your firewall rules to ensure that they make sense and that the IPs are correct. Next is Waza. Keep in mind that you have two focus areas for Waza, the manager, which is the server, and the agent, which is your Windows and or Ubuntu client. In our case, we'll start off with the Windows agent. There are two sets of logs that will generally help you when it comes to errors. The first one is the OSEC log, and that is located under your C drive, program files x86, under OSEC agent. Then if you were to scroll down just a little bit, you will see right under the configuration file, there will be your log file. This will contain logs between the agent and the manager. So if you have some sort of communication error or an active response does not even trigger on the agent, you can then check it out here. You will also need administrator privileges to view this log file. For example, if I were to double click it right now, I will get an error that I cannot view it. That means I need to open up Notepad in Administrative Privileges, right click Notepad, and then I will file open our OSEC log. Again, it is located under Program Files x86 in OSEC Agent, and it is located right underneath the OSEC configuration file. I'll double click that, and these are the logs between the agent and the manager. The second log is the active response log. And this is located under Program Files x86, OSEC Agent, under Active Response. This will show you the details about the active response action itself. So if I were to double click this log file, these are the active response actions. If a certain action is triggered successfully, but you get no results, this is where you would want to look. When it comes to configurations, our main configuration file is the OSEC.conf file. Similar to the log file, you must have administrative privileges to save it. Any changes done in this configuration file will be pushed over to the manager. Do make sure that all of the tags are properly closed and indented properly as well. And this is a nice segue into the next item, which is services. Anytime you modify the OSEC configuration file, you must restart your Waza service to reflect the changes. Otherwise, it will not update. So if you configured something and it's not updating, I would restart the service. Onto our Ubuntu machine, the location for both active response and OSEC logs are in the following location. So I'll change directory into slash var slash OSEC slash log. And then if I were to type in ls, your active response and OSEC log will be listed here. And for the OSEC configuration file, that can be found under slash var slash OSEC slash etc. And then it's called OSEC.conf. And here is your configuration files. To restart the Waza agent in Ubuntu, you simply type in systemctl restart waza agent.service. Now remember, you can always press tab for auto completion. Next is the Waza Manager. In the dashboard, if you do not see any events, you wanna make sure that you're in the correct index. So if we were to go into Discover, make sure that you're in the correct index. In my case, I'm under Alerts. If I wanted to search for events in Archives, I would select Archive. If after a couple minutes and the event that you're looking for is not there, and if your event is not expected to be triggering an alert or a rule, the next thing we want to do is look at the archives directory in the Waza Manager CLI. The archive file is located under var osec logs archives. And then we'll type in ls. And here we can see both our archive JSON file and the archive log file. Do note that these logs roll over each day. So let's say you were doing your lab on a Monday and today is Tuesday. 
your log of interest should be archived inside the directory of year and month. For example, there is a directory called 2023. So I'll change directory in there, type in ls. There is a directory with the month now, which is December. I'll change directory in there, and then I'll type in ls. So now the log is osec-archive appended by the date. Now when you grep for the event of interest, make sure you include the dash i option to ignore case sensitivity. And if you do happen to see your event of interest in the archive, but not in the dashboard, it is likely still indexing, and that will just take some time. Now, if your event is expected to trigger an alert or rule and it hasn't yet, you can take a look at the alerts log directory, which is located under var osec logs alerts. If I type in ls, we can see similar to the archives folder, we have two set of logs, the alerts in a JSON format and then the alerts in a log format, as well as a directory for the year. If you wanted to force an ingestion, you can restart the manager service by typing in system CTL restart waza manager. If you are having some problems with your rules not triggering, do make sure that they are properly formatted and indented correctly and that the rule IDs are above 100,000. If you're having some issues with integration, look into the osec.com file which is located under var osec etc and then osec.conf. As a side note, if you do not see any of the logs under archive or there's no data in your archive logs, take a look at the osec.conf file and make sure that the log all for both JSON and the normal one is set to yes. By default, it is set to no. With the integration, you wanna make sure that the tags are properly indented and properly closed as well as the webhook URL, make sure that is correct. As for active response, make sure that the active response tag is added below the commands. And just like the rest, make sure all the tags are closed and formatted properly. You can test out active response scripts by using a binary called agent underscore control under the following directory, var osec bin, then I'll type in ls, and then we see agent underscore control. To run that, we just need to type in agent underscore control and hit enter. You wanna take note of the response name if you use agent underscore control dash capital L. This will tell you what kind of active responses are currently active and what their name is. Do note that there is a hidden timeout field appended to the name itself. In this case, it is zero. So if you are using an API call for your active response actions, you must include the zero in the name. There is also an additional API log file if you want to check the status of your API calls. This log file is located under the following, var osec logs, and then type in ls. The log is called api.log. Do remember that any changes made to the configuration files, the manager service needs to be restarted every time. Next is the Hive application. If you're running a virtual machine with eight gigs of RAM, you might run into some issues trying to start up the Hive. So it is best to run it using 16 gigs if you have the option, starting with Cassandra. The configuration file is located under the following, slash etc Cassandra slash cassandra.yaml. Make sure that the cluster name is the same name under the hive application.conf file. There are three settings that you must change and those are listen address, RPC address, and seed providers. These are currently listed as local host or 127.0.0.1 by default. And you must change them to your hive public IP. If you make any changes to Cassandra in the configuration file, I would highly recommend you stop the service by typing in systemctl stop Cassandra. And of course you can press tab for auto completion. Once you stop the service, you can go ahead and remove old files by typing in rm space dash rf space var lib Cassandra with an asterisk. This will remove all old 
files. Once those have been removed, you can then start back up the service by typing in system CTL start Cassandra. And then make sure that the service is running by typing in system CTL status Cassandra. You want to make sure that it says active in brackets running. If it says exited, then your service is not running. Next is Elasticsearch. This configuration file is located under the following directory slash etc, Elasticsearch, and the file is called Elasticsearch.yml. Inside this configuration file, do make sure that the following fields are not commented. Cluster name, node name, network host, and cluster initial master node. You want to change the network host to your public IP of the Hive. If you're using the same specifications as I am, which is eight gigs of RAM, and you cannot log into the Hive, you will likely need to configure an additional setting by creating a file called jvm.options and place it under the directory slash etc slash Elasticsearch slash jvm.options.d, exactly like how you see it on the screen. Within that file, you want to have the following configuration settings. This is telling Elasticsearch to only allocate a maximum of two gigs of RAM to Java. Similar to Cassandra, if you make any changes to Elasticsearch in the configuration file, I would recommend you stop the service by typing in systemctl stop Elasticsearch. Then I would remove the files by typing in rm-rf slash var slash lib slash elastic search slash asterisk. Then once all the old files are removed, you can then start back up the service by typing in system CTL start elastic search. And just like Cassandra, make sure that your services are up and running. We move on to the Hive configuration. Make sure that the user and group the Hive has access to the directory slash opt slash THP as this is required for the user to write to. You can do this by typing in chown capital R the hive colon the hive slash opt slash THP. Now, once you type that in, you can verify it by typing in ls la slash opt slash THP. And it should read the hive. The configuration file is located in the following directory slash etc slash the hive slash application.conf. There are a couple things here that you need to make sure of. The first one is the storage hostname IP. By default, it is set to 127.0.0.1. You want to change this to your public IP of the Hive. Next is CQL cluster name. If you changed your cluster name in Cassandra, you want to reflect it over here. And then for index search, the host name, you want to reflect your public IP of the Hive. And then for application.base URL, by default, it is pointing to local host. Just like above, make sure it is pointing to your public IP of the Hive and include the port numbers. Now, if for some reason you still cannot authenticate or access the Hive, you can try commenting out both Cortex and MISP. Remember, these are enabled by default. So in order to disable them, We'll just comment it out and then save the configuration file. And you guessed it, restart the service. You can restart the hive by typing in systemctl, restart the hive. You always want to double check all three services to make sure that they're up and running. So I see, I see my Cassandra currently running. I'll type in my Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is running and then I'll type in the hive and the Hive is running. So all three services are running. This means that I should be able to access the Hive. If you cannot access the Hive, it is likely one of the services had stopped running. There might be a time where you cannot access the Hive and both Cassandra and Elasticsearch services are up, except for the Hive. For some reason, the Hive just cannot start. If that is the case, the first thing we wanna do is stop Cassandra and Elasticsearch service. Once both services have stopped, you want to remove old files from Cassandra. And this is done by typing in rm-rf and Cassandra. Once the old files have been removed, go ahead and start up Cassandra. Move over to Elasticsearch, remove old files from Elasticsearch. Similar concept as above, 
rm-rf and then point it to where Elasticsearch will store its files. Then you want to start up Elasticsearch. Once you have followed that exact step, you can then start the hive and it should start running. This is a command that you can run to view if all three components are running. I'll hit enter. As you can see, we have Elastic, the Hive, and Cassandra. If one is missing, the Hive will either not start or you will not be able to authenticate. The last one is Shuffle. The main thing here is to make sure that you are authenticating with the proper APIs and that your webhook is being used correctly in the Waza Manager. You always want to read the URL when Shuffle performs an API call, similar to how we troubleshooted our virus total, where we took a look at the URL and then matched it against virus totals API documentation to make sure that it is calling out to the correct URI. If not, edit the application by forking it over and make the required changes. I hope this additional bonus section helps you in any way. If you are still encountering errors, do please let me know by leaving them down in the comment section below. I'm no expert at Waza, Shuffle, or The Hive, but I'll try my best and see if I could help. And that is it for the video, and I hope you found it informative. If you did, let me know by hitting that like button and subscribe if you want to. Remember to stay curious and do things differently.